Welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and uh, this is uh, March 1st, 2017, that we're recording this show. And if you want to see all of my episodes of Walk in the Park, you can go to my video blog at walkinthepark.tv, and it's all there. And this week, we're going to go to, um, well, we're going to go to a presentation that was given by the Friends of Robert H. Treeman State Park. This is taken off their web page. It's actually, I made this. Um, and I'm, I'm vice president of the Friends of Robert H. Treeman State Park. And we do, in the uh, wintertime, we give a couple of public presentations. And this time, we're giving a presentation by a guy named Josh Teeter, who uh, works for the Finger Lake State Parks. He's actually in the position that I was in um, years ago when I worked for the state parks as an environmental educator for the Finger Lake State Parks region. So he's given us a sort of an update of things that are going on, projects and so forth. Uh, and so we'll just go right into that. Here's his uh, title page on his PowerPoint. It is History, Stewardship and Changes on the Horizon, Finger Lake State Parks. So let's go right to Josh Teeter. So I spent a few days with Alberto walking all over Watkins Glen, Watermelon Falls, Organic, and Treatment, so that they could get the information for Google. The upper right hand corner, hopefully none of you work for OSHA, um, <laughs> it's me using a pole saw on the back of my truck to gather some ash seeds. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then down here, tucked in my jacket, is a four pound black bear. So. We work with the DEC. We've got a, a female bear who's denned on one of our properties um, down in Addison, New York, uh, for the past four or five years. So every other year we'll go and change her collar out. And while we're doing that, we've got to keep her cubs warm. So I've got the terrible job of having to hold the little bear cub for a while. Um, so these are some of the things that I get to do in the park. So if you wonder why I'm here on Sunday and I'm really, really happy about it, it's because this is what I get to do at work sometimes. Uh, this is the, the mix of things that we're going to talk about in parks. So we've got some history down on the bottom right corner there with the old mill at Robert Treeman State Park. We've got some recreation happening there at Tegannic Falls. Uh, that was last year's first day hike on January 1st. Uh, we had about 600 people show up to run It's 694 this year. So a huge growth, because uh, we like to get people outside. So our mission in parks is to provide a safe and enjoyable recreation and interpretive opportunity for all New York State residents and its visitors. So that's why I'll offer a hike on January 1st, and surprisingly, over 600 people come now. Um, I also offer hikes every first Saturday of the month, and we get a more reasonable turnout, 20 to 40 people come out and go for hikes. 
the upper right hand corner here is where we're going to go to to be responsible stewards of our natural uh, historic and cultural resources so some of you may be familiar with the word stewardship a lot of kids have no idea what it means to be a steward so just be a caretaker so when i think of being a caretaker of culture Think of you know, making sure that people understand why their culture was there, the important things of it, and how it's still alive. Our historical aspects, the mill, understanding that building. We still don't know everything about it. Because most of us weren't there when it was on and alive and running. But I've gone through and I've actually looked at all the patents for all those machines. The building, we think, was built in 1839. But the machinery spans uh, probably the newer stuff was maybe 1890s. So there are patents on all of those machines. So as the milling process evolved, so did the machinery. So understanding that, that kind of history is important. It's important to me, and I'm the guy that makes the kids run through the mill by going back to see where the power is, and seeing what was weighed on the first floor, going up to the third floor, like going down to the first floor, back up to the second floor, and back to the first floor. So I make them follow the path of the grain, and I'll just go floor by floor and make it easy for them. Uh, the upper right is <coughs> something that could kill all the hemlock trees uh, in this region. So hemlocks are, are very important species. It's, just, it's called hemlock oleodelgid. Um, it's an aphid-like insect that came from Japan, southern Japan. We know right, the actual island that it came from. Uh, so humans brought it over. It's attacking our, our hemlock trees. It takes the food that's supposed to go into the needle this insect eats it. The hemlock realizes that the food it's sending to that needle is not getting there, so it stops feeding that needle, and the needle dies. So the insect doesn't kill the tree. The tree's response to the insect harms the tree. It's because it's never had this kind of feeding pressure on it before. So we're dealing with the delgins. So we're, we're actively treating with chemicals to slow this process down, where we can treat with one chemical that will kill all of those insects on a tree and then provide protection for about seven years. The problem is, all of these insects are female. They reproduce asexually, so they don't need males. They lay 200 eggs in the spring and another 200 in the fall. And they're active right now in the cold months of the year. So there aren't many things that feed on them. So this is something that we'll never get rid of. We know we're never going to do this because that one female, she lays 200 eggs in the spring, 50 in the fall. If all of those eggs were to hatch and do the same thing in one year, one individual is responsible for over 22,000 individuals in one year. So we have to create a balance. So we're working on it. So we've got an insect that eats these. So we actually have two. We're trying a silver fly. We've got one that doesn't even have a common name, the Corvus nigrinus. We just call it Larry. <laughs> Larry beetle, uh, which we got from Idaho, because this insect, a very, very close relative of the semi does was lived on the West Coast for at least 5,000 years. So there was an insect there that ate it, so we brought it here. So within parks, um, we actually have a small division that's called the Environmental Management Bureau, and their mission is just a tiny bit different. So it says to preserve and protect native biodiversity. Um, which is what makes New York biodiversity what it is. You know, it's only about 10,000 years old because the last ice age pretty much wiped everything out. So everything our forest is made of is within the past 10,000 years, things expanding and moving in. So we're trying to protect what the biodiversity is of New York um, in our historic sites. And we're trying to ensure healthy, viable ecosystems into the future. So when we talk about that, it may be if we're planting trees and we're concerned if we can even say climate change anymore, we might pick trees that do a little bit better in warmer climates. So some of our park managers are actively picking species that will do better if the temperature is going to rise a little bit so we don't have a bunch of dead trees in parks. So we're thinking of the future. We actually buy land around our parks to expand their borders, to create buffer zones. And some agencies are actually trying to find these north south corridor so animals can move if the climate does change north to south easier without having a bunch of things in the way. So this is the area that I get to work in. So this Finger Lakes shaded area there. Uh, we've got 12 different park regions we could say. We don't do much in the Adirondacks or the Catskill, the DEC does those, but the rest of those are park regions. 
And we say we've got about 180 state parks. Um, it's, it's great that I don't know the exact number because parks are coming online every year. Um, historic sites get mixed in there. We've probably got about 230 different sites that, that we manage. Um, Acreage-wise, we've got about 330,000 acres in New York State that parks deals with. So we've got the yellow squares represent parks. Um, the brown are historic sites. The green are golf courses. And the blue are marinas. So we've got a mix of different types of facilities. Um, so we're going to be to a tree species. Have you guys all heard of the Emerald Ash Borer beetle? So this is one that makes people sad because it's bad. And we're pretty sure we're going to lose all of our ash trees. A lot of people are cutting down their ash trees. Places that have active infestations are losing all of their ash trees. Um, we were kind of asleep for this one. We got in and got too big, too fast, and started to spread. Uh, we lost control of it, essentially, in other parts of the country. It's, it's spread in here, so this is a bad one. So should we just give up? No. 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 This beetle only eats ash trees, though. So if we didn't have any ash trees, we wouldn't have the beetle. Right, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, this got some folks thinking, how about we collect a bunch of seed right now? We still have ash trees, we can collect seeds from our local wild types. So this is what we do. That's why I was standing in the back of my truck, using a pruning saw to, to grab a branch. Um, this is an, an Ithaca College student picking out seeds. We actually find trees, try to get about the brown paper bags worth of ash seeds. And then we could store them for about 30 years. If all the trees are gone after that time, we can actually plant trees for buttermilk. The seeds that we got that buttermilk right back there when we grow those seedlings. We went up to Fairview the Beach. We went out to Stony Brook State Park in Dansville. We got some from Fillmore Glen. So we collected from 52 different trees. And we'll hold those seeds. We don't actually have the storage facility, but we sent them to another organization that has them. If after 30 years the insect is still a problem, we'll put them in a, a facility that can keep them for up to a thousand years. So after the puppy goes through, kills all the ash trees, we can actually repopulate with the local biotypes back where they were. So it's a long-term project. It's not the best way to handle it, but I'm glad that somebody will pay me to do this work, to go out and hopefully 30, 40 years from now, somebody will be open some bags that we collected from. So we do that in a couple ways. So the pole saw, this guy over here um, on the left is using an eight foot long slingshot. Yeah, so if you thought playing with slingshots when you were a kid was just playing, like I professionally shoot things out of a slingshot now. And sometimes you can't reach the trees, so you've got to shoot this little weighted line up there and actually shape the trees. And we've got painter tarps that, that collect the seeds. Um, this is what an office looks like that's housing those seeds before we get them off to the storage facility. So don't tell anybody, but there's a certain little spider that loves the upper branches of ash trees, and those bags were full of them. So every morning we came in, we actually had to clear all the webs so that the women in the business office didn't freak out. <laughs> they were afraid of spiders, and they knew there were thousands of them on our end of the building. They wouldn't let us do something like this. So with my truck, you'd get in there, and there were just webs every single morning. Um, but they eventually made their way outside, so it's OK now. But these are students. This is meant to be an ash tree at um, Hugo Lake State Park. So trees like this, we may actually use some chemicals to treat it. This is an amazing tree. Um, it provides shade for a huge area. So another part of the project was we actually went around wherever there was a building, so a park office, cabins, campsites, um, anything of value in parks. We got out there with students and measured it. GPS it and made a report to all the park managers so that they can make decisions whether they're going to cut them down or they might try to use their limited budget to treat some of these trees. And then whenever possible, if there were female trees, we collected seeds from them so we had those local biotypes again. So these are the these are the scalers. So I said that I was getting training with this the screw. So the guy over here on the left is Dustin. Uh, he works at Watkins Glen all year long. Uh, he does general work. 
but he is an amazing scale. He has absolutely no fear of heights. Um, he will swing out and get to anything that needs to be gotten to. Um, very good with his knots. Uh, I've seen him in action a bunch of times. He may not be the best instructor, because I don't think he identifies with the fear that some people who are just getting into it have. Um, but that's him at Watkins Land. And then over on the right side is a, a shot of the, the wall at Lucifer Falls. So those are just two little scalars in that picture that are hard to see. But these are the folks that go in in the spring, not all that Blue's Rock Off. It's above the trails, so the trails are, are safer to walk on. And what I'm going to talk about here is the shot in the upper right. You can see there's a rock formation, kind of a large outcrop, about 200 feet above the gorge trail to Gannon Falls. This rock has loomed there for about 10,000 years. If you've ever walked there, you may have looked up and seen that and thought, why do they have that up there? <laughs> All right, so my response was, it's been up there for 10,000 years. It could stay up there for another 10,000. So our scalers, go down, they repel, and they look at the rock every year to see if it's actually moved. So they use tap on screws that you would use in masonry or concrete, and they put two screws in, and will measure the distance between those screws to see if the rock has moved. They even take pictures of how they're holding the measuring tape so they know exactly how much it's moved. It hasn't moved. They've been measuring it for years. This year they went over and the rock actually had moved down an inch and out and this was about a week and a half before Memorial Day. <laughs> we had to close the trail. And we closed it uh, for almost a month. So here's some photos. So on the far left is pre-2010, and I've got post-2010. You can see there's a little section that came off um, on a Monday morning unexpectedly. Um, covered the trail. We are able to get the trail open in a couple of days after that one. So post-2010, that's what the center picture is. That's what it looks like. Um, and then on the far right is what it looks like now. So we actually pushed out probably close to 120 tons of rock. And the scalers had never attempted to do this before. But we knew that we needed a jack. So we tried to borrow a hydraulic jack from Cornell, but it wasn't strong enough. Then we had to actually go to New Jersey and get a jack that could push 200,000 pounds at a time. So we had to wedge the jack down in the cracks of the rocks, push, and it would push maybe six inches. You had to retract it, and then you had to put a piece of wood in there. And you push a piece of wood, and put another piece of wood in there. Just keep doing that until we got these larger sections to come off. Um, so we did. We cleaned up the trail that way. Um, Kept people safe so that we could open the trail back. And if you visit, you'll see some of the debris is still there. We took many, many truckloads of material out of there. But from uh, Memorial Day until just recently, the trail was closed from November 28th until January 1st. That's because we were trucking all that material. We had routed the trail around that debris. Because so many locals complained. They really complained because we had closed the trail right before Memorial Day, and we actually rerouted the trail in the stream and left the debris there for the whole season. It was a great educational tool, and all the locals said, I guess you guys were right to close the trail. That, that was pretty dangerous, right? Here's the Adelgid again. Um, talk a little bit about that in the first species, but that's what it looks like on a tree. So if you're out in the woods, and you see what looks like little white fluffy balls on the underside of the, the hemlock trees. That's what the analogy appears like. If you don't know your hemlock trees, there are never great short needles, two little white racing stripes underneath. Um, a great place to wait out a rainstorm because they're so tall and conical. You can stand with your back to the tree. If you can look up, you can't see sunlight. The rain's not going to hit you. Aside from being nice trees, nice shade trees and umbrellas, they actually grow at very steep slopes, which we have in the gorges and very thin soil, and they grow for a long time. So they're very important uh, habitat trees because they shade the water, which increases the oxygen, which helps everything that lives in the water to have healthier water. So this is what the adelgid looks like. It's not covered in wool on the right. 
And that's the layering of the O on the left that needs to be intelligent. And this is some of the other hard work that we have to do. So we've got to monitor sometimes in the canopy. We're either going up to uh, look at temperature sensing equipment, or we're going up to do crowd surveys on top of the tree, because that's usually what gets affected first by these insects. So we have a permanent line set in some trees where we've got to climb up to the top of these hemlock trees that are 120 feet tall and uh, just do some reconnaissance. So this is actually a student uh, who's learning how to tree climb that day. So now we're going to shift to some projects. You guys are probably all familiar with Watkins Glen. It's one of our most visited parks. Uh, some estimates put about 800,000 people a year on the Gorge Trail between May and October. So it's a lot of foot traffic in one area. And for many, many, many years, this parking lot, is, that's what you do, you park, you walk until you get to that entrance tunnel, you go through the entrance tunnel, boom, there you are, you're in the gorge, which is okay. And it's worked really well. You know, I got rated number three state park in the country a couple of years back. But we figured it was time for a change. So instead of having that long parking lot right there, we're actually going to change it and turn it into a park. Because a lot of our visitors can't actually climb the 831 steps that are in there on that mile and a half trail. So we wanted to do a couple of things. One, we thought the parking lot was just, it's just open and top. It's not the best greedy for such a, a beautiful trail that we wanted to create a green space in there. So we're pulling out that whole parking lot, and we're going to park it across the street. We'll still have the visitor center there. We're going to remodel that, uh, newer, nicer bathrooms, and we're going to have a small visitor center that will be staffed by a park employee and a local chamber of commerce employee from Watkins Glen. So they're actually going to pay us rent, so they can talk about how great the whole region is to serve our visitors even better. Works great. <coughs> And then there's going to be some benches and some opportunities for people to sit and hang out. Uh, there's going to be a lot of interpretation. So if you haven't been to Watkins Glen in a while, there'll be six signs going along a waterway dealing with the human history of Watkins Glen. Uh, we're going to have a 14-foot scale model of the gorge um, in one section of this. So you'll actually see what the gorge looks like um, in scale. And there'll be some geology information around that. Uh, there'll be a bunch of ecology um, signs as well. And we're spending close to half a million dollars on the interpretive uh, components that are going to go in here. So this is what the classic uh, visitor center that you may know with that red group is still going to remain. The visitor center will be right there. We're going to kind of block off the road a little bit with some of these planting. Um, but another great thing that we're going to have here, that's um, the visitor center in the upper left. Down at the bottom here, is where my folks will be. So all the interpreters will have an opportunity. There'll be a smaller area with some stadium seating here made out of the old riprap rocks um, where people can see short programs that maybe aren't going to go into the gorge. Or these are going to be topics that won't be covered in the traditional gorge tour, which we'll still be offering. Another project that has been in the works for many, many, many years is the Black Diamond Trail. So it's the old railroad that um, that we're hoping someday will connect Robert Treeman State Park, South Pisgah, up to Tegana Falls State Park. So we just opened eight and a half miles of trail though. They go from Tegana Falls down along 89 and end at the Children's Garden. Um, so it's a railroad that has 400 feet of elevation change over eight and a half miles. So there's not a whole lot of grade there. Um, it's crushed stone, so you can walk it just about any time of the year. Uh, it's been very, very well received. I think we spent about $2.2 million on the surfacing and some of the bridges that we had to put in. A lot of culverts. So this is uh, the Willow Creek Bridge and the Black Diamond Trail. So it's a steel bridge. It's got a concrete pad, but it's got some nice uh, rustic wooden railings going along it. Has anybody driven through the Ford Way at Robert Treatment State Park? Do you have pictures of your car going through it? <laughs> this is one that some people are going to be happy about, some people are not going to be happy about. So the four-way at Robert Treeman has been uh, 
they could spend that time for a lot of campers that they get to drive through the water and get to over the campground. The problem is, if we have a lot of rain, we have to close it. You can't drive a car through it because it'll get swept down. So then you've got to pull out on Route 13 South and then use the old entrance to the park, which is kind of a dangerous spot. If you're not familiar with it, even if you are familiar with it, you've got to slow it down. The chance of getting rear-ended is pretty high. So it's not the safest option. So in this picture, the four ways in the upper left, that's where you would drive across. The one in the upper middle is the catwalk. But if you're on foot, this is how you get across it. But again, if we get high rain, we have to take those boards out, otherwise they get washed away. And upper right, you can see the catwalk from the side. It's got those piers right into the water, uh, which will catch debris. So if we've got some flooding going on, you can see upper left, that catwalk is inundated just with branches and shrubs and things that have washed down. Um, and sometimes if the flood in 2010, this high water event um, can really be damaged just to the foot of there. So they had to do a lot of concrete work uh, to repair that. So the idea is they're going to put a bridge in. So very similar to that bridge that I showed you from the Black Diamond Trail, they're going to put a steel bridge in that has you know, a wooden parapet going along it. Um, it should look something like this. Kind of mixed feelings about this, but it'll make the park much safer for our campers. Okay, so uh, there was a, more to that talk, but uh, we couldn't put it all in this show. Here's some of the other things that projects he was talking about. Buttermilk Falls, new cabins, it's going to be main shelter repair and update the bathroom and so forth at Fillmore Glen, Fairhaven Beach State Park. You're going to do some bathhouse work. Canandigan um, State Historic Site up near Victor, New York, the new Cultural Interpretive Center. You can check that out. Seneca Lake State Park, the Wetland Restoration Project, and there's some work going on at the Overlook. Uh, has been going on at the Overlook at Tagannock Falls. So, um, so I'll include some of that in a future show, I'm sure. And meanwhile, thanks for joining me. That's all we have time for now. So uh, once again, this was a program of the Friends of Robert H. Treman State Park. You can go to our website at TremanParkFriends.org. And uh, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you soon.